All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, officially, welcome to Scientists to Go. My name is Drew, and I'm joined here today with Danielle Frechette. Uh, Danielle got her PhD from the National Institute of Scientific Research in Quebec. She's a researcher for the Department of Marine Resources, where she focuses her research on the impact of climate change on salmon ecology and migration. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Danielle. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen and start my presentation. There we go. Okay. Um, so as Drew said, I work in the Bureau of Sea Run Fisheries and Habitat at the Department of Marine Resources. And in our department, we work with sea run fishes. And sea run fishes are ones that spend part of their life in freshwater and part of their life in the ocean. Most of them, most of the 12 species that we have here in Maine are born in freshwater, and then they move to the ocean where they grow to the adult stage, and then they come back to our rivers to reproduce. We have one exception, and that is the American eel, which is actually born in the ocean and comes into our rivers in Maine at this teeny, teeny, tiny glacial stage, our elver stage, and then they go up the rivers and they grow until they're mighty, uh, lean way back, Susie, <laughs> mighty uh, American eel, where they travel out the rivers uh, to the ocean, to the Sargasso Sea to start their life cycle again. Um, I work mostly with Atlantic salmon, tomcod and rainbow smelts, and I'm gonna talk about those, but I have this awesome model of one of my new favorites, the sea lamprey here on my desk that I thought I'd show you. They have these amazing, suckers that allow them to hold on to rocks and they're a pretty cool species. So I just wanted to share that because show and tell is fun. Um, so how did I get to where I am? I thought I would show you a map because it's been kind of a, a North American wide journey. I grew up in New Hampshire, right near Maine, um, it's with a star. And I went to the University of Vermont to get my Bachelor of Science in Biological Science. I was really interested in marine science as in high school but my high school science teacher gave me a piece of advice that I, that was ended up being really good advice. And she said to start broad and then narrow in. So her recommendation was to study biology. So that's what I did. I got a really broad background in biology. And then after I graduated, I moved over to Maine to do a internship with a group called the Ocean Alliance. And what we were doing was taking tissue samples, skin and blubber from whales, and sequencing a couple of genes in those tissue samples to help us understand how much uh, pollution the whales were being exposed to in the ocean. And it was really fun and really interesting, but I wanted to spend a little more time outside. So I went over to Alaska where I spent two summers working on a small cruise ship as a naturalist. So I got to take people up and down the coast of Alaska, teaching them about the natural history, the wildlife, the ecology of Alaska. Um, and I loved doing that, but I wanted to get back into science. So I moved to California where I did a master's degree in marine science at the um, Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. And this is where I found that that advice my high school teacher had given me was so good because a lot of my friends had studied marine science. And so they had a much narrower understanding. But when I went to a seminar, I had a much broader understanding of biology in general. So it really helped me um, understand so much about um, marine science and oceanography. During that time, um, oh, I didn't tell you what I studied. Um, so a lot of my work is uses telemetry, which is using tags to track animals and figure out where they're going and what they're doing and how they're using their habitat. Um, and so my research project during my master's was using telemetry to figure out where gulls were eating and what they were eating, and specifically how many endangered salmon they were eating. Um, and so we caught gulls, we put tags on them, and then I tracked them up and down the coast of Monterey Bay, which was a lot of fun. Um, and it also led me, that project led me to a job with NOAA Fisheries running a life cycle monitoring station for endangered coho salmon and threatened steelhead. And the photo of the fish there is that it's a female steelhead. Um, and what we were doing was um, trying to understand how the populations were doing at all the different life cycle stages from the spawning adults through the juveniles, all the way back to the numbers of adults returning. And that's why we call it life cycle monitoring. It's monitoring the entire life cycle from really from egg to adult. Um, after that, 
I moved over to the province of Quebec where I did my PhD in water sciences, again, using telemetry. And this time my project was looking at how adult salmon use the river during the warm summer months. Um, because salmon are a cold water loving species. And one of the challenges they face with climate change is warming rivers and being able to find enough cold water during the warm summer months to be able to survive, to reproduce in the fall. Um, so I spent six years in Quebec and then I brought, came back to Maine. So kind of full circle, Maine to Maine, um, where I took my job with the Department of Marine Resources. And so now I'll tell you a little bit about what I do at DMR. Um, I run two programs. The first is uh, working with volunteers to help us understand some of our sea run fishes here. And this is actually a project in collaboration with GMRI. We have two projects in GMRI's ecosystem investigation network, finding frost fish and smelt spawning. These are public programs. Um, and so we have volunteers who help us get out into the streams uh, and rivers across the coast of Maine during the winter to help us understand when, where, and how many frost fish or tomcod are spawning. And then in the spring to help us figure out the same thing for rainbow smelt, where are they spawning? When are they spawning? And how many are they spawning? Or how many are spawning? And the reason that working with volunteers is so important to our data collection is because Maine has a coastline that's longer than the coastline of California. And we have over 300 known streams where tomcod and smelt have historically spawned. These are also species that are very cold water, um, cold water dependent. In fact, they're really kind of cold water loving species so much so that they uh, both have an antifreeze protein that allows them to survive water temperatures that are actually below freezing. And this is important for tomcod because they actually come in and spawn in winter, kind of right around the winter solstice. And then the smelt are coming in in the winter months into the larger rivers where the water's cold, they're feeding in those colder waters, and then they're moving into our smaller streams and coastal tributaries to spawn in the spring. Um, so really like they need that, they, they love cold water, but with climate change, cold water is disappearing. And so we wanna understand what's happening with their populations as the Gulf of Maine warms um, and as, wind, as our winters become more dynamic and um, as the, the things with the ice cover change. So we're actually gonna launch the Tomcod project in about two weeks. And this is something that um, we, we bring in people from the public. So if this is something that piques your interest, you can talk to your parents um, to see if they wanna participate with you. Uh, we do also have some classrooms that participate with the smelt spawning. So thought I'd mention that. Um, I am gonna spend whoops, the rest of my talk talking about the other project I run, which is called Salmon for Maine's Rivers. And I'll explain more about what that is in a minute. But first, I wanted to walk through the Atlantic salmon life cycle. So as a, a sea run fish, an anadromous fish, Atlantic salmon spawn in the fall, right about now. So they're, they're just finishing now. The adults will dig nests in the gravel called a red. Um, and actually it's the female who does all the digging. She lays the eggs into the gravel and then covers them up with her tail. Those eggs that have been laid in the past few weeks will incubate all winter. And sometime in early May, the eggs will hatch. And these little alevin, these little salmon with a yolk sac will remain in the gravel for a few weeks longer. And then in mid-May, they will emerge from the gravel. They come swim up out of the gravel and start eating. At this point, we call them fry. And they're about, about 20 millimeters long. They're pretty small. The fry will find a good place to grow. And as they grow, they become larger. And we start to call them par. And they're called par for these kind of marks on their side called a par mark. Um, and the, time, the, the point where they come, become par is really more size dependent. If they grow really fast, they could become par in August. If they grow slower, they could become par in September. Here in Maine, the par will spend two to three years in fresh water. And then in their second or third year, they in the spring, they'll undergo this really cool transformation 
where they get longer, they get skinnier, they get really silvery. And most importantly, the their gills switch from keeping salt in to pumping salt out. And that allows them to move from fresh water into the ocean. And they will spend one to three years in the ocean eating, growing, getting big. They'll actually go all the way to Greenland before they come back as adults in the spring and summer, spend the summer months in the river. And then in the fall, they will reproduce. That's the, that is the salmon life cycle. So trivia question for you in the chat, please tell me in the United States, Atlantic salmon are A, endangered, B, threatened, C, extinct, or D, not in trouble. I'll give you just a second to answer that question. So, let's see, I can't see the chat. So maybe Drew can tell me when we have a few answers. Okay, we have our first guess is A. Uh, we have another one that says threatened. I myself was going to guess be threatened. All right, Anybody? well, let's, let's find out. So Maine is actually the last state, the only state remaining in the entire United States where we still have Atlantic salmon. They are endangered, but we still have them. Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, where I'm from, lost our salmon. Um, Maine still has a population of salmon. They are really hanging on right now um, and they're endangered. So a big part of my job is working on helping bring salmon back from really the brink of extinction. We are kind of at this tipping point where we're either going to save salmon or we're going to lose them. So how many salmon are in Maine now? Um, these are the number of returning adult salmon to the entire U.S. population. So you can see um, Black is Long Island Sound and yellow is Central New England. There's still some, but they really disappear in the last few years. Um, here in Maine, Atlantic salmon, um, there was a petition to list them as endangered back in the 90s. In 2000, about a small group of our rivers in down east Maine were listed as endangered. And then in 2009, that listing was expanded to include all the salmon in the Kennebec River, the Penobscot River, um, all the rivers of down east Maine, and then all the salmon that are part of a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Conservation Hatchery Program, which I'm going to talk more about in a minute. But you can see that, so this is, you know, we're, we're down in the thousands. A really good year recently, the most recently year was in 2011, um, and that was still, you know, that was around 4,000 salmon. Rivers of New England and New York used to support somewhere between 300,000 and 500,000 Atlantic salmon. So we're really at a tiny fraction of what we used to have. So conservation hatchery program run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is really what's keeping salmon from going extinct. They basically take adult salmon, spawn them, it, spawn them in hatcheries and raise their offspring in captivity and then release them at some of those different life stages that I talked about. We have two key ways that this is done. We have returning adult salmon captured in the Penobscot River. This is what we call our sea run broodstock. And then we have biologists that go out and collect those par in the fall um, for the down east rivers um, and the rivers in um, uh, like the Sheepscot River. And those par are raised until they're mature, until they're adults, raised in captivity, and then they're spawned. And that creates the, the next generation of salmon. Um, so I wanted to try to show you a little bit about how we do it on the Penobscot River. So this is Milford Dam. This is the first dam on the Penobscot River. And the fish enter, and then they're brought up in this elevator. And the elevator brings them into an upper um, chamber. Should be some coming. There we go. Watch for the fish. That those that's a bunch of river herring. And I think we're gonna see a salmon in just a second. Get a salmon or first. So this they're they're brought into this upper flume. This is my colleague Jason. So you can see just how big that upper flume is. And then once they're in the upper flume, they pass through a viewing window so we can count the fish, we can identify what species are coming. And then they're brought up into the upper lift. So this is this is what the um that what you might see in the viewing window. 
And I love this shot here because you can see um, that we see five different species of sea run fish. You see that big lamprey, those kind of snake like lamprey, the biggest fish are the salmon. The smallest ones are blueback herring and river um, alewives. And then there's some shad in there, the ones with the big spot or shad. Oops. And then once they are passed through the viewing window, they're brought up to an, through another elevator into the upper pools. And they're, they're pushed, they're released into these sorting pools. And that's where we can either send most of the sea run fish out a chute and into the river, or the salmon we can take and process, figure out whether they're a hatchery return or a fish that was born in the wild, and we can collect them to take them to the Fish and Wildlife Service hatchery. So see kind of what a, a fish, a, a lift of fish might look like coming into that sorting pool. Here it comes. So it's a lot of water. It could be a lot of fish. There, there's a bunch of river herring. The bigger fish you're seeing are salmon. Yep, there's a big salmon right there. So yep, now they're in the tank. They can be sorted um, and again, collected for broodstock. So once the salmon are taken to the hatchery, they're spawned and um, their eggs are, are incubated. And then we put them in the river in a few different ways. The ways that we send salmon home, the first thing we do, which is really cool, is called eyed egg planting. So you can see the eggs up in this, um, kind of, this is your standard kitchen measuring cup. And you can see each of those eggs has two teeny tiny little eyes. This means they, they've been fertilized and they're ready to go in the gravel. And we use this hydraulic pump to actually create an artificial red, an artificial salmon red in a nest in the gravel. And we then, so we create this pocket, we gently pour the eggs down into the pocket, and then we very, very carefully remove those funnels. And that allows the gravel to gently fall on top of the eggs. And then they can incubate naturally in the river all winter and emerge in the spring at the same time that any naturally spawned salmon eggs are hatching. And it's really fun. We do it in the winter, in the ice, in the snow, um, and it's it's really exciting. Next thing we do is called fry planting. So that's taking that that stage that's just come out of the egg, no longer has its yolk sac, and we release those right in the river. And we usually do this by canoe. So we put them in coolers and we take them out by canoe so we can get them into um, really good habitat. And we'll also release fish at the par stage in the fall. Then in the Penobscot River and the Kennebec River, we also release uh, smolts. And this is that, again, that stage is right, ready to go right to the ocean. So these are the fish that were, they stayed in the hatchery really through their whole juvenile phase. And we put them in the river right when they're ready to go to sea. Um, but even though we're doing all of this, salmon still have a lot of challenges to face. Most of the really good habitat is still above dams. This figure here shows all of the um, active and remnant dams across Maine's landscape. So there's a lot of, a lot of barriers in the way um, between salmon and their spawning habitat. We have really low survival in the ocean right now. Um, only, that should say one, only one of every 1000 salmon smolts that we put in the river comes back as an adult. So those hatchery salmon that we put out as smolts, if we put a thousand in the river, only one will come back. Um, the hatchery spolts are also not as good at surviving in reproducing in the wild as they're naturally spawned as the naturally born salmon. We have so few salmon that have huge areas of empty habitat, and then we have climate change. So all of these things combined are really, really making it tough for salmon in Maine. So one of the ways we're trying to help salmon recover is with the program that I run called Salmon for Maine's Rivers. And this is a partnership with uh, the Penobscot Nation, our federal partners at NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wild Service, Ser <laughs> U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, and then some industry and NGO partners as well um, to raise salmon all the way to the mature adult stage and then put them in the rivers to spawn. And we call this smolt to adult supplementation. So we take that smolt stage and instead of sending them to the ocean, we keep them in captivity until they're big adults that are ready to spawn. And 
one of the key ways that this could help us with recovery is that we have better survival in captivity than in the ocean. Again, if we take 5,000 smolts and send them up to Greenland, five might come back. But if we raise them in captivity, and even if survival is only 50%, we'll still have 2,500 adult salmon that can go right in the rivers to reproduce. And we know that salmon that grow up in the river do better, they survive better in the ocean than salmon that grow up in the hatchery. And so even though the fish that we grow to maturity aren't wild, their offspring will be wild. Their babies will be wild from the beginning. Um, and so this increases the amount of, of wildness or um, in the population. They're, they're facing predators, there's disease they have to contend with, they have to survive, they have to find habitat to survive hot water. Um, so they're they're much more um, hardy than the salmon that were protected in the hatchery their whole uh, life cycle. So we did we started this project in 2021. We took smolts from Green Lake National Fish Hatchery, and you're seeing that these are the the pools where the salmon were raised to the smolt stage. We transferred them by truck to the University of Maine Center for Cooperative Aquaculture Research. And we raised them. These, this is when they're about a year and a half old. Um, so they're about 18 inches long there. And then once they were mature, we transported them to the river. So we did this in 2022. And then again, this fall, we released salmon for spawning in, in um, a couple of our really most pristine rivers. And we released them by truck and we also released them by hand. So this is me releasing a, a salmon into the river. And once they're in the river, we want to know what they're doing. So we're working with the University of Maine, and we tagged a bunch of the salmon with these acoustic transmitters. Um, and so what this transmitter does, it's a tag that it has a battery. And so every 30 to 60 seconds, it sends out a ping. And that ping has a, num a numeric code in it. And that code is unique to the fish. And so we put a, these um, photo on the far right here is a hand holding an acoustic receiver. So this receiver will detect that ping. So we put a bunch of these receivers out and anytime a fish swims by one of those receivers, it sends out its ping, the receiver records it, and we know the time, the date, the fish, and some of our fish even have a temperature sensor in their tag. So we'll know what the fish's body temperature was when it went past the receiver. So we'll use these data to figure out where the salmon were during the fall spawning time. We will use these to understand where they spent the, river, the winter. Did they go right out to sea or did they find um, a lake or a dam head pond to spend the winter in? A head pond is the area of the river that's kind of like a big lake upstream of a dam. And, um, and what time, when do they go to the river? When do they go from the river to the ocean in the spring? And if they survive, we might actually detect them coming back from the ocean in a year or two because Atlantic salmon can spawn more than once in their life. They don't die after spawning like Pacific salmon. Another thing we do, which we actually just finished up doing last week, this is what I spent my last week doing before Thanksgiving, was looking for salmon reds or salmon nests. Um, we either do it in canoe, like in the photo you see on the left, or we do it by walking. And what we're looking for, the photo in the middle shows two adult salmon on a red. So you get this really cleaned out area of the gravel where the female has moved everything around with her tail to lay her eggs. And then on the right, you see kind of that cleaned space. So we're, we count them, we look for where they are, where are the salmon spawning, how many reds do we find? That's a good indication of how many salmon are spawning. And then we wanna know if they reproduce. So in the fall, so in August and September, once it's not too hot, but before it's too cold, we go out with these backpack electrofishers. So it's a backpack that sends an electric current into the water that stuns the fish so we can catch them with a net. And then we can measure them. Um, we can take a little clip of their tail fin to get genetics. And that'll tell us if they were a fish that we released as part of our Salmon for Maine's Rivers program or if they're naturally spawned. Um, and that these are kind of the kind of some of the three, the key ways that we track how our, the salmon populations are doing kind of in that life cycle approach that I mentioned earlier on. So that wraps up my presentation part and I really look forward to answering your questions. Um, but I guess I have one question for you before 
um, you start asking me questions is, do you know what the closest salmon river, so think of where you're sitting right now, do you know where your closest salmon river is? And what river is it? I'm not gonna lie, Danielle and I talked about this right before and she had to educate me about where the closest mine were in Portland, but it was really interesting. Oh, Penobscot is an answer that we have. Great. You all that is our biggest it. salmon river. <laughs> Anybody else? I had yeah, to cheat a little. Oh, we have Sandy River. Uh, oh, the Sandy. Excellent. We have four The egg rivers. planting photos were from the Sandy River. Oh, great. That's so cool. Uh, someone said Four River. But oh, Androscoggin. Okay. Androscoggin, yep. Nice. Great. Well, I am close to see Androscoggin as well. So I'm looking forward to your questions now. Great. So if anybody has questions, you can put them in the chat. I know I learned so much during this. I really had no idea how a fishery worked. Um, so that was really informative for me. So I appreciate that. I was curious, actually, as folks are putting their questions in the chat, I know on that graph about the salmon population, uh, it looked like there was a big drop in 20, like 2011, but it was after all the, some of the conservation efforts. Was there something particular that happened that year? Um. 2011 was a really good year and then it dropped off. We think there was some changes in the ocean that because that that drop wasn't seen just here in Maine. It was also seen up through all of the Canadian provinces where there are Atlantic salmon. So we think there were just some changes in ocean conditions, um, possibly climate change related. Um, we're still trying to figure it out, um, but it may have to do with changes in the food that was available um, at the time. Hmm, gotcha. Okay, we got a couple questions in. Uh, one okay. is, why did you choose biology? It sounds like you were interested to start, but maybe what drew you to it? Um, so I chose biology because I, so I'm going to be honest, I was terrible at science in fifth, sixth, seventh grade. It was physics, it was chemistry, I was awful at it. No, it wasn't awful. I was a low B student. I didn't, I wasn't interested in it. What I love was being outside, hiking, getting muddy, going out for walks around streams. Um, do, just, I didn't like to sit still. I love to be outside playing outdoors. I went to some outdoor ed summer camps as a kid. Um, and that's what I was really interested in. Then when I was in eighth grade, my we did biology. And my science teacher pulled me aside. I had the same science teacher all the way through middle school. And she pulled me aside one day. She's like, do you, you really like this, don't you? You're doing really well. Because I'd gone from being a low B student to an A student. I was like, yeah, this is cool. I really like this. Like it's animals. It's it's all the stuff that I loved. I didn't never knew that the stuff that I loved, the nature stuff that I loved outside was actually part of science. And so like my eyes were open and I loved it. And she encouraged me to take biology classes in high school. And so I took every single biology class my high school offered. Um, I participated on my high school's Envirothon team, which was a super awesome experience. And I know that Maine schools have that too. So um, it was a lot of fun to learn about forestry and soils and, and all of those things. Um, and I, so I knew biology was the path I wanted to go on because it let me study all the things that I liked about the world. Um, and then when I got to California and started working on my master's project and working in the stream, I realized that I could get paid for getting muddy. You know, as a kid, my mom let me get muddy, but I wasn't allowed to bring the mud in the house. Now I get paid to get muddy and it's really awesome. That's awesome. I feel very similarly. I like to get my hands dirty too. All right, some more questions for you. Um, how old is the oldest salmon that you've found? Let's see, the oldest salmon that I have found was actually a steelhead, um, which is the anadromous form, the sea run form of a rainbow trout in California. She had, um, we had three different years of detections of her in the river as an adult because she had a pit tag, which a pit tag is like the microchip that's in your cat or dog. It's a little tag that um, it doesn't have a battery, but when you pass an electric current over it, it sends this the signal out. Um, cool fact, the microchips in your cat and dog were actually invented for salmon. Oh, I had no um, idea. So yeah, so we had a pit tag steelhead that 
she'd gone, she'd been tagged as a juvenile and she went out to the ocean and we had three different years where we recorded her um, coming back to spawn. And when we found her, she was actually dead on her, probably what we think based on the numbers of detections that she had spawned four times and was probably nine years old. Right. I had no idea fish could live that long. Yeah. And, and um, salmon are short, short lived compared to some um, rockfish species that can live to be a hundred years old or more. A hundred. Oh my gosh. You're blowing my mind right now. That's crazy. Okay. We have some more questions. Uh, one is, do you see bass sometimes? See what? Bass. Some folks. Bass. Are mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, the bass. Yeah. So we do have um, bass in a lot of our rivers here in Maine. They're a natural part of the sea run fish community. Um, and we don't handle them very often. Um, they generally don't come into the trap at Milford Dam. Um, and we don't, we don't, some of our my colleagues have a project where they're tagging and tracking striped bass, um, but that's I haven't worked with them on that. There's some pretty cool studies with striped bass being done at DMR. Very cool. Okay, somebody was curious about the most colorful fish you have found. Is there one most a native fish, fish. That's particularly beautiful? You know that some of the it, one of the really cool things about salmon is their markings are unique and you can look at a fish from the top and they have this spot pattern and it can be completely different from one fish to another and we had one fish that we raised in our project this year that its jaw the tip of its jaw was black and had the spots on its back were big and black and it was just it was a really beautiful fish very um kind of unique and stunning looking um salmon get really amazing colors at the spawning season and um, I think steelhead are the prettiest they're rainbow you know they're rainbow they're, they're big sea run rainbow trout so they have that beautiful rainbow color to them um, but an adult mature ready to spawn Atlantic salmon is just really beautiful yeah I love that color gradient that they have it's so beautiful um, oh Susan shared her experience as a biologist she said I became a biologist because my mother took me on nature walks as a small kid just to keep me from being bored and restless does not take much of a push in that direction when you're motivated. I totally resonate. I think that's uh, lovely. Um, yeah, me oh. too. It's my my dad took me bird watching and hiking from the moment I could walk, really, even before actually. I love that. I'm trying to get into birding right now myself, so any tips and tricks are appreciated. <laughs> um, we got a good question about how do you know how old a fish is? So it sounds like you oh, maybe know question. what life stage they are, but yeah. So. Um... You can, from the physical appearance, you can tell whether they're, a, you know, what, roughly what age they are, kind of, if they're in a par, if they're par, they're, if they're par and they're this big, they're probably a year old. If they're par and they're this big, they're probably two. Um, but the real way that we do it, um, so fish scales, salmon scales grow in rings like a tree. And you can, and you'll get kind of a darker ring in winter when there's less growth. You'll get another darker ring when they move from freshwater to saltwater. And then every winter, there'll be a ring, um, a darker ring. And so you can actually figure out how old they are from their scales. Um, So you can just take a tiny little sample of the scale without killing the fish, and you can figure out how old it is. Um, You kind of need a baseline for that, um, because if the water's warm, they'll grow faster. If it's too warm, they'll grow slower. If there's a lot of fish, together a high density, they'll grow slower. If the density is low, so they've got a lot of space, they'll grow faster. Um, So it can be a little challenging with the scales. Something else we can do if we have a dead fish, we can actually take the otoliths, which are ear bones, out of the top of the skull and we can section them. And just like the scales, the otoliths grow with a ring pattern. And so you can figure it out that way. As well. We uh, in Lab Venture at GMRI, we use the otoliths of black sea bass, and we look at how how to age a fish that way. So I didn't know that you could actually use the scales as well. That's pretty neat. Yeah, and there are other fish like with um, sturgeon. We use um, their their uh, scutes, which are their kind of the plates of their skin. Those grow. Um, we're looking. We're hopefully looking at some other ways of maybe aging sturgeon um, that are not invasive because sturgeon are, are 
in, we have two species of sturgeon here, one's threatened and the other's endangered. Um, so really trying to find the best ways of, of aging them without um, taking parts that require the fish to be dead. Yes, a little counterintuitive. <laughs> We got another question about how you tell whether a fish is male or female. Oh, okay. Um, when they're small, it's really hard. Um, and even when they first come back from the ocean, it can be really hard too. Um, they can look really similar, but as the um, spawning season gets closer, their bodies change. The males will grow this, their jaw will get long and hooked. We call that a kite. Um, their color pattern is different between a male and female in spawning colors, but the real giveaway is that big type um, because the fish, they're the same size. Females might even be bigger than males sometimes. Um, but once you get to spawning, it's really easy to tell a male from a female just because their faces are so different. Is there a reason that the fish grows or the male fish grows that jaw or is it just kind of show like a peacock tail? Um, we think it's uh, involved in competition. The males will really like, they'll go after each other. They'll, they'll really fight for um, a female. They'll like find a female and she'll start spawning and, and they will guard that female. They'll chase after each other. They'll grab each other. The teeth kind of get biggish. They'll go after each other. Um, kind of a, and the bigger ones, the bigger males with bigger kites might simply scare off the smaller ones just by their appearance, but they will, uh, they engage in some pretty fierce, what we call male, male competition for females. Right. I guess that makes sense. Fighting for resources. Um, all right. We have a couple more questions. Uh, one is what is the most challenging part of your job? Um, field work wise, the most challenging part is weather. A lot of our work is so weather dependent. Uh, we can't do the spawning surveys when there's high water. Um, we can't do the spawning surveys if the ice comes in too soon. Um, we can't electrofish if it's too hot or too much rain. Um, when we, we do some trapping for smolts as well, and that if the river gets too high, really water conditions matter a lot. And with climate change, one of the things we're seeing is bigger rain events. Think back over this past year, how many times did we get two to five inches of rain on one storm here in Maine? And that makes it really challenging and dangerous for us. We just can't work um, under this with those river conditions. So it's making it us have to rethink some of the ways that we monitor salmon. Um, like this year, we we didn't we weren't able to do a lot of our electro fishing because when the water was calm, you know, wasn't too high, it was too hot. And when the when it wasn't too hot, the water was too high. Um, so that that's really probably our biggest field challenge. I think overall the biggest challenge is that it's it's really hard to recover an endangered species. Um, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of communication and coordination amongst all of our partners. Um, we man salmon are actually co-managed. Uh, we have four different groups that manage them. It's NOAA Fisheries, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Penobscot Nation and Department of Marine Resources. So we all have to work together um, and, and that can be challenging sometimes to really be able to find the, yeah. Okay, we have a couple speedy last questions. Sure. Um, if someone wanted to get involved with the, the smelt project, for example, what, what does that process look like? Yeah, so what we do is we have a training um, depending on where you are on the coastline. So in kind of Southern and Midcoast Maine, our training will be uh, I think we've actually, it's going to be March 3rd or 4th, um, the first Monday of, of March, and people attend the training. They um, fill out a Google form that tells us they want to do the survey. Uh, we, we train them using this online training, um, send out all the training materials. We help them find a stream um, that might be nearby, or they might know a stream, and um, we make sure they have all the things they need to go out and do the surveys. And then all of the data is entered um, through the GMRI Ecosystem Investigation Network portal. Um, so the TomCod training, I think it's, it's in about two weeks. Um, the key thing is that uh, with the GMRI programs, to have to set up an account and do the survey, you need to be 18 or older. So we need um, kids to partner up with a, a grown up, with a parent or a grandparent, um, or if it's a teacher, you can reach out to me directly and we can um, set things up. 
That's so great. But That's the best way, way to find example. information, yeah, the best way to find information is just to go to the um, GMRI Ecosystem Investigation Network portal and then look at the smelt spawning and the Finding Frostfish pages. Great. I'll pop those back in the chat again, just in case any of you educators out there are interested. Um, but we'll end with our final question, which is what is your favorite part of your job? Um, I think you might have guessed it. My favorite part of my job is being outside um, doing field work. I, we just finished the red counts. And I think across the board, our whole team agrees that the red counts are the most fun thing because we're out all day in a canoe or on foot trekking through the woods, through the stream, seeing fish spawning. It's it's a really special experience. Um, but I also really like seeing a full project through and doing the data analysis and writing and publishing on the, the hind end as well. So um, those are really my two favorite things is publishing, doing the field work to collect the data and then publishing the data so that it's accessible to other people in a, in a scientific journal. That is so great. Well, thank you so much, Danielle, for your time. Uh, this has been so informative and so cool. Definitely excited to get involved. Um, so thank you all for joining. Hope to see you next time. Our next scientist to go is on, let me pull it up right now. It's on December 19th, Tuesday, same time, 10 a.m. Um, and it's with Maya Thomas. And we'll get to hear about some of her uh, microbiology and uh, zooplankton research, which will be great. So thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you all for joining.